Good morning. This is an EWTN Newslink. I'm Teresa Tomio. It's Thursday of the fourth week of Easter and the Feast of St. Rose Venerini. The Supreme Court hears by telephone from attorneys representing the Little Sisters of the Poor. They're challenging the state of Pennsylvania over their moral objection to providing employees with contraception. Mother Provincial Lorraine Marie McGuire lamenting for nearly a decade we have been in a battle for the soul of our ministry. The pontifical Swiss Guards marking Wednesday's anniversary of the sack of Rome with a private mass and wreath laying ceremony streamed over the internet. The annual swearing in of new Swiss Guards, which would usually take place May 6, is postponed to October due to COVID restrictions. And the U.S. Department of Education finalizing campus sexual assault rules protecting the rights of accused students. Those new rules replacing Obama-era policies, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos says, pressured schools to deny students' rights. For more news with a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and Morning Glory starts now. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Vincent DeRosa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who restore human nature to yet greater dignity than at its beginning, look upon the amazing mystery of your loving kindness, and in those you have chosen to make new through the wonder of rebirth. May you preserve the gifts of your enduring grace and blessing. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 And I will come to the altar of God, to God, my joy and gladness. To you will I give thanks on the harp, O God, my God. Beautiful. I know you're walking us through Psalm 43 this week. Um, you know, I was thinking about it. I, I didn't think any, just anybody at, at that time with the Jews could approach the altar of God. Could they? Um, no. Right. <laughs> because I mean, because the, the, the only place the altar was was inside the temple. Temple. Uh huh. Um, and so they could not um, go. But 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 the, here they're you know they're talking as as a person approaching the altar because remember they went to Jerusalem every year mm-hmm. for. Um, or for the Feast of Passover, um, the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast, Feast of Weeks. And so they would make their way uh, to the temple and, and inside the gates of the temple, but they could not go inside the temple. But that's what they mean about approaching, mm-hmm. you know, not actually going to the altar. And that's what the beautiful thing about us. We can actually, because of Jesus, we can approach the altar now. Mm-hmm. You know, we can make an offering of our lives now, you know, to the Lord. Um, and, and so this is a wonderful reminder of how privileged you are to be able to enter into the house of the Lord and go all the way uh, to the altar. But and not, and the sacrifice there is the gift of our life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Beautiful. The sacrifice there is a gift of our lives. Something to think about. We have a lot of interesting things that we're discussing today on morning glory. Yeah. We'll be talking about uh, actually how can we help our parishes so that when the time comes, we're all able to go back up to the altar of God again. Right. Uh, what are things yeah. you can do to help your community get ready? All right. Indeed. Yeah, we'll also talk about how has Eucharistic adoration changed your life? Uh, I know many of us have not been able to go to adoration. So it's like, what, a, what a wonderful time just to share of, uh, some stories about some encounters with the Lord before that beautiful sacrament. So we'll talk about that. And we're also going to talk about a patron saint for single mothers. I know we talk about marriage and motherhood a lot in the show, and I thought it was really important as we approach Mother's Day to alert people to a patron saint for uh, single mothers, and her name is St. Margaret of Cortona. And we'll tell, talk about her story later on in the show. And, of course, we'd love for you to join the conversation. You can text us by texting the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for response. Uh, text us your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. And please note that message and data rates may apply. Uh, I listened a little bit yesterday to the Little Sisters of the Poor oral arguments at the Supreme Court, and boy, it was really quite fascinating. And I have to say, those lawyers have to be on their toes because all kinds of things were thrown to them, hypotheticals and whatnot. But there were mm-hmm. some very novel arguments or questions that I heard that I was like, where are they getting that? And, and uh uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who, by the way, was calling in from the hospital. She was at a hospital in Maryland. I was reading about that after the fact. And uh, she kept saying that if the little sisters, you know, get this uh, 
this exemption, if they get what they want, basically that women are going to not have the seamless uh, affordable access to contraceptives as Congress intended in the ACA. And uh, the council uh, that were for the support responded said that was not in the ACA. The ACA never explicitly mentioned contraceptives. It was HHS that came back and, you know, said preventative services uh, and things like that. And so it was just so much. I learned so much. And also they had an unfortunate incident when another case was being <laughs> heard that, you know, you can, that somebody flushed a toilet. So that made a lot of news, of course, <laughs> the, the historic time of everybody calling in. So the justices were on their phones. The attorneys were on their phones. They have not figured out who it was that flushed the toilet at that time, though. So you know, that'll <laughs> remain a mystery. <laughs> I used to be in a parish where they had installed bathrooms, you know, many years after the church was actually built. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought, oh, this is such a great idea. This is so wonderful. We finally have a bathroom in the church and da da but the problem was you could hear because it was one of those real strong flushes, you know, oh, yeah, like an. Yeah. So every now and then <laughs> in the middle of mass, you hear <laughs> <laughs> a girlfriend of mine told me they had like an all hands meeting at work and they had, you know, some employees all over the country. So they'd be dialing in remotely. And after this uh, VP or SVP or whatever gave this big presentation, she's like, so what do you think? And then somebody flushed a toilet. <laughs> so she said the message was that was just garbage and we just listened to it. No yeah. <laughs> she said it was hilarious. I was just like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> So but, they couldn't um, see you know, each other. It, it was just no. on uh, audio only. Audio only. You oh, cannot see if you if you watched on C-SPAN. No, I mean they, them. The between the judge, the just the, um, no. the attorneys and the judge. No, okay. No, well, but what happened okay. is when you watched on C-SPAN, whoever was speaking, they'd have a still picture of the person. Oh, so whichever justice would ask a question, they'd show whichever attorney was talking. They'd show who they were and their title. Um, so that was really interesting. They did have a bit of a little bit of a in the beginning as uh, some kind of glitch because justice thomas was trying to ask a question but they could never get him they could never get his voice on so they were like well we'll come back to you justice thomas but they eventually got it but it was interesting i'll tell you what when when america is done with all this i think one of the first things they're going to have to reopen is clothing stores because nobody's put on real pants in a couple of weeks and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, might, they might need to have a little tailoring done you know i mean this uh... is true <laughs> But, you know, I hope they do that again with oral arguments going forward because, you know, people used to wait in line to try to get in there and hear oral arguments. It was actually quite nice to have whoever could access it to be able to listen. That was that was fantastic. Um, another thing that I think is fantastic is today is a national day of prayer. Um, and there's an event going on today at 4 p.m. Eastern. And all you have to do if you want to hear what's coming out of the White House there is go to whitehouse.gov slash live at 4 p.m. Eastern today. There's a prayer event for the National Day of Prayer coming from the White House. Interesting, I thought. So um, I know we're all, you know, looking at the economic impacts of what's going mm -hmm. on with the economy. And now people are recognizing there are going to be some impacts to the church, too, huh? Oh, certainly. You know, I mean, uh, and there were some great pieces done on this by uh, the Catholic News Agency and uh, J.D. Flynn uh, and, and his gang over there. Uh, but the idea that, you know, collections are going to go down as people um, deal with their how this is impacting their households mm -hmm. and if they've yeah. lost jobs and so on, right? And if collections in parishes go down, mm -hmm. not only does the parish budget go down, but the chancery budget goes down because the, the central offices, the chancery of any given diocese, usually th makes its budget by collecting from the parishes either a tax on a portion of their Sunday uh, revenue or uh, by having a special collection of their own. But no matter how you slice it, if people's households are, uh, are, are you know, losing money, well, mm -hmm. then uh, the parishes will as well. And uh, it's going to be something that, you know, we, we need to pray about because their cuts are going to be needed. Uh, and some places, it won't just be a matter of cuts. In some places, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, jobs. You're talking about even parishes that maybe were just skating on the edge of sort of an existential decision yeah. right do, do we yeah. stay open or do we close and merge uh that's going to be exacerbated by this so uh parishioners really have to be on per parishioners really have to be attentive to the needs of their parish budget talk to your priest uh ask questions some priests for whatever reason they don't feel comfortable talking about this kind of stuff but they need to yeah. uh so the people of god really need to be proactive and say father how are we doing what's needed 
you know, what is what should each family be giving on an average? Uh, you know, just give some idea, and then families have to make their own decisions. Uh, but but cuts are almost certainly coming, and you know, uh, people have to realize that. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about is before all of this, I know in the Archdiocese of Washington, people were angry with uh, Cardinal World already and stopped giving money. And so, because I, I remember everywhere I was going, you know, you people were putting their, you know, how much they were in the negative. You'd see last week's collection, last week's bills were in the negative. People, you know, and the priest having pictures of damage to the property and church saying, we need money for this and that. And I'm like, how much more? Um, the, the, I can just say that I, I imagine it had to be tight for some parishes already, even before the That's pandemic, exactly because right. of people being upset about how they felt like the you know, the church was handling sexual abuse and so they weren't giving, you know? And so I imagine that this is just, just exacerbating something that was already maybe a problem in some, in some diocese already. So, yeah. So you think that there's going to be a push for online giving? Uh, that way, you know, there's, there's not necessarily a collection, but it gets kids taken out of the account. I mean, how big is that? I mean, I know we well, started doing it at our little place, you know, so I know more and more parishes seem to be doing that. Is that something you think, that the, they're going to push now, that priests and, and pastors are going to push for that now and encourage that? So I, I hope so. And I'll tell you, in the midst of the pandemic, the online giving that we had begun fostering among people, and then we're making a big push on right before the pandemic started, not knowing what would come, the online giving is what has saved our parish ah, uh, in, see, in the midst yeah. of this time. As, as a result of online giving, we have been able to maintain all of our charitable giving mm -hmm. commitments. We've maintained our buildings, we've been able to keep all of our staff fully employed, uh, all because uh, people were attentive to that, that online giving component. Um, I mean, that, that, that's that been critically important. And mm -hmm. it has, in the last two years, since I got to, to this parish, we've uh, almost quadrupled our online giving mm -hmm. uh, from, from what wow. it was. And that's been, that's that's made the difference between the parish continuing to function in a normal way or the parish being in a very bad place. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful for it. And I hope other people will encourage their parishes to do likewise. Yeah. I hope, I hope there is a big push because no matter what happens, you go on vacation or mm -hmm. anything yeah. happens that you, the, the parish will still get paid. So I think that's important to push that. I, I like mm -hmm. it. Well, speaking of funds, uh, former NFL quarterback, Brett Favre is repaying $1.1 million in welfare money that he received for multiple speeches where he did not show up, the Mississippi State Auditor said yesterday. Auditor Shad White said his office received $500,000 from Favre on Wednesday, plus a commitment that he'll repay the other 600000 in installments over the next few months. Now, you might be saying, why is he doing this? Well, apparently, Auditor Shad White had been auditing the spending by the Mississippi Department of Human Services, and it showed that Favre had been paid by the Mississippi Community Education Center, which was a nonprofit group. Um, by the way, their leader had been indicted in a welfare embezzlement scheme. So this community education center had contracts with Human Services to spend money through the Temporary Assistance for Needy Family Programs, also known as TANF. And so through the money that was supposed to be spent for TANF, this Mississippi Community Education Center sent Brent Favre $1.1 $1 .1 million for him to make th speeches for at least three events. And the auditor's report said they, upon reviewing the dates, they weren't able to determine if he did speak or not. And it turns out he didn't speak for these three events. Um, he doesn't face any criminal charges. He um, is paying the money back. But you have to wonder, why is the Mississippi Com Community Education Center spending any money that's supposed to be going to welfare funds you know why are they spending a million dollars why are they spending anything i mean mississippi is one of the poorest states in our union so it's just nuts so yeah but brett Favre is paying it back he's like i didn't know you know all this stuff he's not I've done anything illegal you know but wow just something mm. else let's mm. see what do we have coming up on morning glory we are going to be talking about uh how we can help our parishes to prepare for reopening and you can join us on Facebook. Look for EWTN Radio and join Facebook. We are live. Morning Glory podcasts are available 24-7 at EWTNMorningGlory.com. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. 
Father Benedict Groeschel. No Catholic can support abortion and that Catholics are responsible to take serious action against legalized abortion. The leading Catholic voices are on EWTN Radio. Now there's a fast and easy way to get in touch with EWTN. The EWTN Everything Number. Call 1-800-447-EWTN to get the latest information on programming, special events, pilgrimages, and more. Our EWTN Family Viewer Services representatives are ready to help you with whatever your needs may be. The EWTN Everything Number. 1-800-447-EWTN. EWTN. We need to pray for priests that they have courage and strength to be faithful. Pray for bishops who have whole dioceses under them. And they're responsible for everyone. A religious who teach, we should pray for them. Cardinals, our Holy Father, our families, our neighbors, everybody who has a hard time living the truth or preaching the truth. We all need that extra strength of prayer. CNA is the only fast, reliable, and free Catholic news source that brings blogs, stories, and opinions to your fingertips. The latest Catholic news is at catholicnewsagency.com. We're on YouTube, the EWTN YouTube channel. Morning Glory, it's Catholic from coast to coast. Yep, you are listening to Morning Glory. We are Catholic from coast to coast, and we're so glad you're with us. Did you know that you can pray the rosary every day with the WTN? Yep. At 5.30 a.m. Eastern, the Holy Rosary with Mother Angelica and the nuns of Our Lady of the Angels Monastery is available, as well as again at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The rosary is a place with Father Benedict Groeschel and Simonetta. That comes on 9.30 p.m. Eastern. EWTN Radio also brings you the Holy Rosary twice each day, and we've been doing this for over 25 years. Again, tune in every morning for Mother Angelica and every evening for Father Benedict Groeschel, and it's only on EWTN Radio. Did you know that the rosary, if you pray the rosary in a pious association or with family, that you can get an indulgence? Yep, I was looking at that in my handbook of indulgence. Another reason to make sure you join in and pray uh, with EWTN. Say your rosary. Dying, you won't be alone. That's a good thing. I'm Gloria Purvis, and I'm here with the dynamic deacon Harold Burke Sivers and Father Vincent DeRosa. He's the pastor of St. Mary's Church in Chinatown in D.C. We'd love for you to join us. Um, you can email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking a little bit uh, right now about... Um, how we can help our parishes to reopen. And I'm, I'm just basing this on the experience of my own parish as we're hoping and praying that uh, Washington and Maryland, uh, you know, which is where our diocese is, um, you know, sort of continue on the road to uh, starting a, a, the next phase of all this, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but so we've started, we don't have any official uh, rules or anything yet from, from our diocese or from our go local government, but we're trying to game out some hypotheticals and so on. And, one of the things we said was, well, within our parish, uh, we're certainly going to have to communicate, right? Because whatever reopening looks like, it's going to look different from the norm. So that means you're going to have to communicate to people what the procedures are, what the schedule is, etc. Well, if you're going to communicate, you got to have, number one, an accurate email list, mm. an accurate phone list, right? And a couple weeks ago, when this all started, I called all of our parishioners. And first of all, I was surprised to find I went through the, the list from the official parish uh, database there's a lot of parishioners who don't put their phone numbers uh on the on the database mm. you know when, when you register mm. for, the, for your parish um and every now and then your priest does need to reach you you know uh, or <laughs> you know you, you try to email the person and realize that the email was misspelled or is old and you know nobody's using it anymore or, mm. or whatever right so we've begun using our online giving list to augment and and work together and clarify our uh, regular communications list uh but but what one of the things it just teaches me is folks call your parish make sure that your parish has an accurate phone number and an accurate email address for you right so that you can get the latest information on what the reopening procedures are make sure if you're on social media that you have liked or followed your parish uh, so that you know, as soon as things happen, uh, what reopening is going to look like. You know, some parishes 
are talking about things like, all right, well, if we're only allowed to have so many people in the church, we might have to double up our mass schedule and say to people, you know, last names A through F, go to this mass. Last names G through N, go through, and so on and so forth. And I don't know, that's not what we're doing necessarily, but mm. whatever happens, there's going to have to be communication. And I'm, I, it was really kind of surprising to me how few people um, are truly plugged in in that regard. So please do make sure that your priest has, uh, the parish office has um, appropriate contact information for you. Mm -hmm. Another thing uh, you'll, you'll want to do is call and say, Father, what do you need? Right? One of the things that we're starting to hypothetically talk about and, and theorize about here is, you know, where are we going to get cleaning supplies? Right? It's not exactly easy to get your hands on true. a pallet, you know, yeah. a pallet of true. disinfectant yeah. or, or whatever. Uh, but it might be possible for each parishioner to make a little pilgrimage to the parish with one canister of, say, spray disinfectant for the pews or, um, or surface cleaner for the parish bathrooms or, you know, I don't know, whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you call your parish priest, call your parish council member and say, what does the parish need? Is there anything that I can contribute? Because if 400 parishioners all bring one container of, of an item, uh, it's going to be a lot easier for the parish to collect the critical mass that's going to be necessary. Because in, in many places, what they're talking about is cleaning the pews after every single oh, surface, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Mm. Um, or uh, maybe we're talking about getting masks, you know? Oh, yeah. What, so, I, I don't know, know what, what yeah. are your thoughts? Do you guys have thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I mean, I, it makes so much sense. I, you know, it's kind of surprising to me. I, I guess, now that I'm thinking about I guess that's true. Probably maybe some people haven't updated their parish records in a while. And so you don't have a way, um, they ha I don't have a way of getting in touch. If you needed to send um, a blast email to let everybody know, here's what's happening, here's the procedures, here's if your last name begins with X, do this. Or even if you have to have a sign-up genius for mass, honestly, because mm -hmm. you might be limited in number of folks. Um, I also was thinking about you probably might need tape because I've heard some places are marking off the spots like this will put you six feet away, even in the pews and stuff like that yep. to mark off where people can sit to maintain social distance um, in the pews, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just thinking there's so many um, resources that you probably could use that any parish could probably use. But yeah, that would be nice if everybody that ha assuming they have access to bleach wipes or something that can be used to clean the surfaces to, and how much is going to need to be cleaned afterwards. Yeah, I mean, you know, if everybody again, contributes a little, it makes it not so difficult to do it, assuming people have these things. And communication is going to be key because certain states and certain local governments are proving product X but not product Y, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, right. And, and yeah, bleach we, wipes aren't going to do any good on wooden pews because that then you got to refinish the pews. But anyway, Deacon, well, go ahead. Right, I, wonder yeah. what you use, I wonder what you use then. Yeah, we want to hear from our Morning Glory listeners. Love to hear what your ideas are on this. You can text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. It takes your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. Remember that message and data rates may apply. Or go ahead and send us an email, morningglory at EWTN.com. The other thing I think you need to consider is gloves. <clears throat> I mean, if you've got to wipe down the pews, you know, the people that are doing that, say it's the ushers or you have volunteers doing that, you have to provide them. With, you know, the gloves that you put on. And then, you, again, you can't use disinfectant wipes or what. You know, if you have people bring things, you know, you have to make sure that they bring things that can actually be used. Um, mm -hmm. And things like door handles even have to be oh, yeah. wiped down and things like that. So there's a lot to consider. And and, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, next week uh, the plan that the Archdiocese of Portland has. Um, but, but one of the things, you know, that, uh, our, our governor uh, is allowing a slow reopening. And so they're moving up from 10 people to 25 people. Well, how do you select which 25 people come to Mass? <laughs> you know, especially mm -hmm. a, a large, do you do more Masses then? Or do you, I mean, how do you try to accommodate people? And what's, what's fair, you know, um, as far as, you know, who gets to come, who doesn't get to come? Is there a sign-up? How does that all work? So I'll be Let talking also, about that next week because I think we're doing a good job. It could serve as a model for other uh, dioceses around the country. Did and let me throw out another fact that mm -hmm. people don't think about. In many, 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 many parishes, the ushers are that group of guys over the age of 60 
who are just kind of always in the back of the church. Sometimes the parish priest doesn't even have an email list to be able to contact them because they're just always there. Right. But in this present situation, it may be the case that precisely the, the usher demographic are the people who need to stay home, you know? So you know, mm. call your priest and say, hey, can I volunteer to be an usher, uh, to be yeah. a cleaner, to be, you know. You know, now you're making me think about, well, what kind of things could you use to clean wood? I also know that brass doorknobs, um, but they probably still need to be wiped down. One of the things that people don't know is that brass doorknobs, unvarnished brass doorknobs, disinfect themselves about eight hours. There's something about brass, but you still, in this case, we can't wait eight hours because people are going to be touching it all the time. You still need to clean things. But it makes me wonder, like, what cleaning supp supplies are actually available? I've been looking for cleaning vinegar, which is different from regular vinegar. Cleaning vi Regular vinegar mm -hmm. is 5% acidity and you can use that for cooking cleaning vinegar is six percent acidity and that one percent makes it 20 times stronger than the one that you cook with i've been mm -hmm. looking for cleaning vinegar it is sold out everywhere uh, so oh, you know boy. even just trying to get things that you might want to clean with and i'm not talking about the 30 percent vinegar that is um th th that kind of stuff is used for outdoors you can't cook with it or clean with it it's too acidic that's for killing weeds and stuff outside i'm talking about the six percent that will they're also on the on the um, label might say 20% uh, cleaning vinegar, where you, that's a run on that, it's hard to find. So if people have a lead on where to get stuff, let your parish know Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's that thing. too, you know. Yeah. I'm wondering what else people think, uh, people, what else people think that they could, uh, how, how else they could help their parishes. Let us know, morningglory at EWTN.com. Were you gonna say something, Father? Just that we all need to pull together. This is not a time for assuming someone else will help you need to help whoever you are you need to help Amen. uh so call call your parish and find out how you can help because we cannot afford to have a lack of participation in this moment one well, the other thing i thought about is if they have if they tell you we can only have 10 people in a parish and you show up in your number 11 please just turn around and go away <laughs> don't yeah, don't give yeah. don't hassle the people about well it's just one more person what difference is going to make yeah, you know what? We, we have these uh, rules to try to keep everybody safe so that we can reopen and stay open. So cooperate. Let's see what's coming up next. Well, we're going to talk about how has Eucharistic adoration changed your life? We're going to talk about St. Margaret of Cortona, a patron saint for single moms. Listen to us on Alexa. Just say, Alexa. Ask EWTN to play Morning Glory. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Carry EWTN with you everywhere. You can enjoy EWTN TV and radio live streams, prayers and devotionals, and keep up on the latest Catholic news. Visit EWTNapps.com. He was a doctor of the church, a Carmelite, and one of the most famous mystics of all time. Matthew Bunsen and the doctors of the church. St. John of the Cross wanted to help all Christians to become saints. One of his most important teachings was to encourage us all to learn how to love. For there is no love, he said, put love, and you will find love. He died in 1591. For more about the doctors of the church, visit doctorsofthechurch.com. 60 on 10 with Monsignor Charles Pope. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. The seventh commandment forbids theft, that is unjustly taking or keeping another's property against the reasonable will of the owner. It also prohibits deliberate retention of goods, lent, or of objects lost. It prohibits business fraud, paying unjust wages, forcing up prices, and taking advantage of the ignorance or the hardship of another person. It prohibits the appropriation and use for private purposes of common goods. Also, work poorly done, tax evasion, forgery of checks, invoices, excessive expenses, and waste. Under the Seventh Commandment is also tucked our social justice teachings, because if I have two coats, one of them belongs to the poor, and I reasonably ought to give what belongs to them, because God gave all the goods of this world for all the people of this world. For more about the Ten Commandments, visit EWTNRC.com. Later this morning on More to Life, claiming power over the past. We'll help you find healing for past hurts. That's later this morning on More to Life. Now back to Morning Glory. The EWTN news headlines are next. 
Good morning. This is an EWTN Newslink. I'm Teresa Tamio. It's Thursday of the fourth week of Easter and the Feast of St. Rose Venerini. Archbishop Gregory Hartmeyer installed in Atlanta because of health restrictions. Only a few priests, most wearing face masks, attended his installation mass yesterday at the Cathedral of Christ the King. He succeeds Archbishop Wilton Gregory, who is now in Washington. Most COVID-19 patients entering New York hospitals are not working and tend to be older than 50. The governor's office releasing a survey that found retirees accounted for 37 percent of hospitalizations during the survey period, another 46 percent were unemployed. And the collapsing global economy will likely have an enduring dramatic impact on parishes, chanceries, and other Catholic ministries. Few dioceses have found effective ways to continue raising money to replace the Sunday collections. Most studies suggest online giving makes up only a small fraction of revenue for most parishes. For more news from a Catholic perspective, visit EWTNnews.com. I'm Teresa Tomio, and now back to Morning Glory. On the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Live from our nation's capital, this is Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast with Gloria Purvis, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and Father Vincent DeRosa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mother Mary, we ask you to watch over us uh, with your loving care today. Protect us under your mantle. Keep us and our families safe, and to those who uh, are suffering or those who have died, please uh, apply your prayers, which are so moving to the heart of Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 And we got a word from Mother Angelica. Mother says, she's the EWTN founders, by the way, if you're tuning in and you've never heard of EWTN before, (laughs) Mother Angelica, let me just be clear, she is. Mother Angelica says, I am not like a pebble on the beach a grain of sand on the seashore, or just one of millions of human beings past, present, and future. No, I am a unique human being loved by God as if I were an only child. Wow. That's beautiful. That's that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, just think of um, all the people that have existed or ever existed, right? Um, What what was uh, the, the Lord told Abraham? Your descendants shall be as numerous as the sands on the shore of the sea. And so we're not just like one grain of sand amongst many. I mean, God cherishes us as if we were the only grain of sand, like every person. So they were the mm-hmm. only person that's ever existed. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a beautiful insight by Mother Angelica. I'd say, and you can get this, Mother Angelica's Daily Quotes. It's the uh, Daily Quotes from Mother Angelica Perpetual Calendar. You can get that at EWTNRC.com. After this segment, we're going to introduce everybody to a patron saint from si- for single mothers. Her name is St. Margaret of Cortona. We'll talk about her story uh, a little bit after this segment. But right now, Deacon, what are we discussing? Well, you know, as uh, Father DeRose was talking about, we're, we're already thinking about the possibility of coming back to Mass, thanks be to God. And one thing mm-hmm. we'll also be returning to is Eucharistic adoration, which I miss. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a, a weekly ad- adoration um, uh, devotee, so it's been, uh, although it's been online and that's been good, but it's not it's not the same thing. It's like talking to somebody on the phone as opposed to being with them in person, you know? Mm-hmm. But, but, but some people, you know, uh, hopefully will, um, you know, I hope that there's a Eucharistic renaissance. That's what I'm hoping. Um, that this time away from Christ and his presence in the Eucharist will really um, inspire people to devote more time before Jesus in the Blessed Sacraments. I hope Eucharistic Adoration Chapels explode. Well, until uh, given social distancing, they won't explode. But I right. hope the love and devotion and the desire to go to Eucharistic Adoration um, is, is one of the effects of this. So what? So I just so I want to talk a little bit about adoration. Um, you know, when people say, well, wait, I, I can just pray in front of the tabernacle. You know, and I'm like, okay, that that you could you could do that. There's, there's no problem with that. Um, but to think about it like this: say you invite someone over to your house that you love, that you just love spending time with, and when they get to your front door, you know, they they knock on the door, and you say, hey, you see that chair? Pull it over and sit down. And you pull a chair and sit down, and you talk to them through the door. That works, you know. But <laughs> isn't isn't it always better to be in the presence of the person that you love when you're talking to them? You know, that that's Eucharistic adoration. And so what was some of the, the, the purpose of exposition of the Blessed Sacrament? Well, to acknowledge Christ's marvelous presence in the Eucharist, <laughs> I mean, just to spend time with Jesus, you know, like kind of like the apostles did. And for me, you, you, see, I, you sit there and just talk to him. 
You know, just talk. You guys have a conversation. Sometimes I worry about things. You know, I might as well worry before Jesus. I'm going to worry, going to worry anyway. Might as well do it before Jesus. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe he can give me a little uh, encouragement there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also is a wonderful extension of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we receive him personally into our bodies at Mass. And a way to kind of sustain that love is, is to spend time with him in Eucharistic adoration yeah. um, and foster uh, worship. I think um, uh, people who go to Eucharist adoration, their devotion to the Eucharist and their reverence at Mass, um, I, I think there's a, a, a wonderful connection there between the two. You know, Eucharistic adoration is where I had my mystical experience at the age of 12 that brought me into the church. Um, I grew up in a family that wasn't Catholic. I was alone Catholic as a 12-year-old. And it was because of Eucharistic adoration that um, having that mystical experience um in front of the Lord where I came to know that it was real, it was alive. And, um, yeah, just then led me to tell my family I'm becoming a Catholic. <laughs> I mean, kind of laugh at it now. I kind of laugh about it now, but boy, that's something that 12 year olds, now that I think about it, 12 year old having that experience and just being like, yep, see y'all. I'm going over to Catholic church. <laughs> and they supported it. They dropped me off. I went to mass every Sunday by myself. They said my family totally supported wow. my conversion. So yeah, Eucharistic adoration had that impact on me. I've often found that it's it's also a place where um, clarity comes. You know, you could be in a, in a holy place, surrounded in a holy place by holy things, uh, but sometimes you need the silence of Eucharistic adoration yeah. and the singular focus of just focusing on Jesus's body in the tabernacle. Yeah. Um, not the ta- in the uh, the monstrance rather. Yeah. And the two examples for me were uh, Lourdes. And St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In Lourdes, there is so much going on. I mean, it's hustling and bustling and, oh, so much activity. And, and it wasn't until I found the silent adoration chapel that I was able to actually appreciate the good of Lourdes, the holiness of Lourdes. Um, mm-hmm. Likewise, in St. Peter's, the basilica can just be very, very uh, noisy sometimes. There can be a great din inside of it. And you go into the adoration chapel and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, focus yeah so even in the exactly. mid, even in the midst of good things not just bad things but in the midst of good things uh adoration can help us discern which of those good things the lord wants us to incorporate into our life mm. yeah you know, we love yeah. to hear from our morning glory listeners about your experience in adoration and i know there are stories out there please share them with us i talk to people all the time about this mm-hmm. uh go ahead and send us an email morning glory at EW10.com. Tell us your first name and how you're listening. Or check us out on Instagram. Just search for EWTN Radio. And I love what you said about silence. That is so important. Um, you know, because we're so surrounded by noise and distractions and uh, devices. And, 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 and some people, um, Monsignor Pope was noting the other day, some people can't even get to sleep without listening to a radio or having some kind of noise or something TV, there. And, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 but the Psalm 46 verse 11 says, be still and know that I am God or Yada there could also mean like experience, you know, to know is to experience. Mm. So mm-hmm. to be still and experience God in the silence and in the quiet and to be comfortable with silence again, because that's where you listen to God's voice. Or it could be the opposite. I was just saying in my in my daily dose of, of Deacon Harold that I, that I post uh, every day on Facebook and on my YouTube channel. I was talking about an experience I had in Saskatchewan uh, at an event where they had Eucharistic adoration and they were playing some music. Usually I like a quiet adoration, but it was okay. It was a youth thing. So I'm like, okay, the youth like their music. That's cool. And um, to the left of me was this young lady. She started just, the. she was just so moved. She just started singing. And I, and, and I was, I mean, I, I'm shaking now just thinking about it. I was so deeply moved it was the most pow- one of the most powerful palpable experiences of jesus i've ever experienced eucharistic adoration it was amazing um and 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 i'm still friends with this young she's married now and has family and stuff now but uh man it was just uh it was powerful and i think that moment even brought me even to a deeper love of, of eucharistic adoration and here's the best part there's no formula People say, what do I do when I get there? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, there's a suggested format, you know, of like 15 minutes, like adoration, petition, reparation, and love. 
But sometimes I just go like, okay, Jesus, we got to work this out. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, just okay, we we got we got some things we need to work on here, Jesus. Let, let, let's let's figure this out together. Mm-hmm. You know, just have that heart to heart conversation. Which, in fact, adoratio, when you look at the etymology, the origin of that word, literally means mouth to mouth. You know, to be mouth to mouth with God. You know, um, the speaking. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. The, the thing that's so beautiful about yeah, I, I'll just say, I know someone who's been, um, how do I say this? She cannot get out. She stays in a special institution because of, she has to have like a special way that she's carried out and all this stuff. So she doesn't get out a lot. Um, and she's just one of the holiest people I know. She's a victim soul for Christ. And what she does is she asks her guardian angel to go and visit all the tabernacles where Jesus is left alone. So she can't get there to him. She asks her guardian angel to go on her behalf and spend vigil, spend time with the Lord. Um, and I just think that's such a beautiful uh, practice. And But this is somebody who can't get out but i thought the purity of her love and her heart and her asking that was such a thing that touched me that um, i said you know uh, i i need to be thinking about people like her while we're while i'm locked in here uh so to speak and can't get out i'm thinking about her and what she does for her that that's her way of doing eucharistic adoration because she can't get places and she asked her guardian angel to go on her behalf and i think that's such a touching loving uh thing to do but um, I, I'm sure there's so many people that have wonderful stories about Eucharistic adoration. They can share it with us, please. Email us, morningglory at EWTN.com. I'll just share one other story. This young woman I knew when I was at this particular parish, she was in a young adult group with me. And she was like, I, I want to go to graduate school and I don't know which program and I need the money. And um, two weeks later, she came back and said, well, I went to adoration and just sat there and was writing and gave it over to the Lord. And she said, and I got a full scholarship like a couple of days later. <laughs> you know? wow. She's like, she was, she had all this anxiety, but she's like, you know what? I just need to go sit down in front of him, tell him and just let it be. And Miracles then he answered. Happen. Indeed. Indeed. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. We serve an awesome God. I'll we tell do. You. I, yeah. I, I, I will tell you one other thing. I went to Franciscan university in Steubenville for Eucharistic adoration once. Oh, oh yeah. my <laughs> yeah, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. was beautiful. Yeah, they do it right there, man. Mm-hmm, <laughs> That's mm-hmm, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's for they sure. Adore. <laughs> yeah. They do. They do. I went to one of their FOPs, a festival of praise, and over the weekend and stuff, they had Eucharistic adoration, and the place was packed, and it was just so beautiful. The, the quiet love from everybody there, you could feel it. It was palpable. Yeah, and just so quickly, what are some of the fruits of Eucharistic adoration. Um, you know, what what kind of things can, can happen? Oh, I think repentance and conversion. You know, uh, when you have that heart-to-heart conversation, things get brought to the surface, things that need to be dealt with, even from your past, from your life, things you're trying to work through. I think that the beautiful fruits of repentance and conversion happen there. Um, greater reverence at Mass. I, I talked about that connection a little bit earlier. And here's interesting, service to the poor. You know, I remember as an adoration once and um, this this uh, this guy, uh, we, we were adoring together. We just happened to leave at the same time. And, uh, you know, and and uh, we were just chatting and he said he had lost his job and he was praying. What do I do now, God? And I said, well, why don't you go down and work at a local homeless, homeless shelter? <laughs> I said, well, he goes, wait a minute. What? I said, do what you got to do to find another job, but go ahead and do that. You know, how, we know what door the Lord is open for you there. Yeah, and, uh, and sure enough, he went down there, started working at a homeless shelter, met a guy there in line with him serving food, and the guy ended up hiring him. <laughs> for Isn't that something? Job. Not at the shelter, but but in the he's an engineer or something like oh, that. So right, just from right. a conversation, you know, getting a job. Uh, so you never know. And plus, vocations, vocations to the priesthood, religious life, or even to marriage. Just going, Lord, is this the person that I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with? Are you truly calling me to be a priest? Whatever your, whatever God. Uh, I want to say to me, God, I want to follow. I, I, I want Indeed. to open my heart completely to you. That, you know, that's I, the beauty of Eucharistic adoration. I read this beautiful definition of uh, discernment. And it's that um, it's, discernment is uh, the mind that is enlightened by God, where the conscience that is enlightened by God um, that helps you to choose between two good things. And how can you better be enlightened? than in the presence of his body and blood, soul, and divinity. Awakening your soul to the warmth of Christ this spring. Morning Glory, it's Catholic from coast to coast.
It's time for Family Man with Dr. Gregory Popcha. We all know that consistency is important for our children's well-being, but a recent study in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry shows just how true that is. Researchers found that young children who experienced multiple moves and school changes had up to a 60% greater risk for exhibiting serious mental health problems in adolescents, including psychosis. Consistency in a child's life isn't just key, it's critical. Our church teaches us that human beings need ritual to be healthy and happy. Rather than being boring, repetitious actions, rituals bring order, meaning, and peace to our daily lives. Multiple moves and school changes disrupt the rituals that allow children to develop the ability to regulate their emotional, psychological, and relational lives. To give your kids an advantage, work hard to keep up rituals like family meals, game nights, family prayer, family days, and of course, Sunday Mass as a family. I'm Dr. Greg Popchek, but you can call me Family Man. To discover more ways faith can enrich your life, visit CatholicCounselors.com. Here is today's quote from Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar. I am not like a pebble on the beach, a grain of sand on the seashore, or just one of millions of human beings past, present, and future. No, I am a unique human being loved by God as if I were an only child. Mother Angelica's Perpetual Calendar with her reflections is available at EWTNRC.com. That's EWTNRC.com. Text us. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Then text your first name, how you're listening, and your comment. Morning Glory. It's Catholic from coast to coast. Yes, and I know that there is going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. It looks like, uh, you know, uh, some of the coronavirus restrictions, at least about going to mass, so we're just at the, seems to be the start of um, uh, of being able to, to attend the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass again. Yay! But until then, EWTN has <laughs> your back. Um, you can uh, watch Mass at EWTN from Our Lady of Angels Chapel every morning at 8 a.m. Eastern uh, on television or, or 8 a.m. On, on the radio as well, right after Morning Glory. So you start your day off with Morning Glory and go right into Mass. And here's the awesome part. You can also listen to Mass every two hours on EWTN Radio Essentials. Uh, so beautiful. And and I know EWTN has been doing Mass uh, forever, and I love watching Mass on EWTN. And, uh, and again, it really brings you uh, a deeper intimacy with the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, a co-host here, along with Father Vincent DeRosa and Gloria Purvis. And I love this, even though Mother's Day is coming up and you've been going through super mom saints. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and we yeah. have a wonderful one uh, today. Yeah, she's the patron saint of single moms. Um, her story is interesting. Um, uh, it's not the story of the every single mom, but um, it's just a story I think that a, a lot of people, um, maybe if you lived a bit in the world, ha- can relate to. Anyway, she was born around 1247 and died, you know, young, young by our standards, probably wasn't young then. She died at age 50 in 1297. Uh, and um, so she was very beautiful. And she stood out in her village for her good looks and her quick wit. And she caught the attention, when she was about 14 years old, she caught the eye of Arsenio, who was a 16-year-old son of the local baron. And 16 then and, and 14 then are different from 12, 14 and 16 now. By then, you know, I, they're probably considered more adultish um, than what our 14-year-olds and 16-year-olds are. But anyway, this 16-year-old Arsenio invited Margaret to live with him at the castle a, as his mistress. And she accepted. Now, you got to understand, she was a peasant. And being able to live with a rich young man probably afforded her a very comfortable life. She didn't have to live the harsh life as a peasant. She was able to live in ease and comfort in this castle where servants did everything for her. And the only thing that made her unhappy was that Arsenio was real candid with her. Like, look, I'm never going to marry you. I'm just never going to marry you. (laughs) Just that's just it. You're a peasant. I am not. I'm a baron's son. I'm. I, you can be my mistress, but I can't marry you. <laughs> and <laughs> for some reason, I don't know why we do this. Why women do this? Believe we could change him. Oh, oh we could just yeah. change him. So she thought, you know what? I bet I can make him change his mind. And she had a child. She had a son, and she thought for sure this baby was going to persuade him to marry her. But guess what? 
It never happened. And she lived as his mistress for nine years. The only thing that stopped this relationship is that he left the castle for a few days to tend to some business at one, at one of the family's estates, but he didn't return on the day that he was expected to return. He didn't come the day after that, nor the day after that. And then his dog showed up alone. And the dog's behavior, because you know animals are very tied it's to never their, a good sign. Right? <laughs> yeah, and so she's like, yeah. what is wrong with the dog? And she said the dog was whining. And then she said it would like just, she was, so she said, let me just follow the dog where he's going outside. And she said she had a sense of dread about it. And the dog led her to where Arsenio was basically dead, lying in a shallow pit. He had been murdered and was dead and decaying. And no one knows who killed Arsenio. But what got her was she was like thinking about the state of her soul. I mean, this sort of jarred her. She was like, if death came upon him so quickly, you know, did he have time to repent? And what would mm. she do if death took her suddenly? Would she even have the sense to beg God for his mercy and forgiveness and sort of woke her up out of this way that she was living? And she decided to take a fresh start. And so she took her little boy from the castle and left. She left Arsenio's castle as she headed to the hilltop town of Cor Cortona, where the Franciscans, she, she met the Franciscans. She heard they would help repentant sinners. And the Franciscans of C Cortona did help her. They found a home for her and her son. They had time, signed two uh, Franciscan priests to be her spiritual directors. And uh, they, uh, they arranged for her son to go to school when he was old enough. And she really took on a life of uh, repentance. And um, I don't know if you guys have heard anything about St. Margaret of Cortona, or if you want to say anything else before I go deeper into oh. her story. I mean, I would, I would just say that this is a great example of, um, you know, a life of, of conversion. And sometimes conversion, you know, it's, it's so easy for us to, to paint a narrative, to write a narrative of mm -hmm. conversion as this sort of like, oh, good people, be, uh, evil people who become good people. And yeah. it's all sort of very black and white, right? But as you pointed out, like, this woman had a hard life. Yeah. And it wasn't easy. And Things of the heart are rarely easy, and so her heart relationship with this guy, Arsenio, was complicated mm -hmm. and messy and so on. But over time, God does his work, and hearts can evolve. You know, I, and I'm not trying to, to soft pedal it, but like, there is, there, there can be this sort of lengthy evolution of a heart to Christ yes. and toward mm -hmm. a better, uh, better options, better choices. Um, and this seems to be a great example of that, you know? Yeah, yeah, one of the things you were saying is that the, she thought that, that he could change, yeah. that she could change him, but yes. you, only God can change people. <laughs> right. What happens, your witness and your example um, can can help maybe open someone's heart, but it, it ha it's the Holy Spirit that changes minds and hearts and lives. We just have to be uh, witnesses and plant those seeds of faith in people's lives. Well, that's the thing, how she was seduced by the idea that she could just change him. He could love her, even though he was straight up like, it's never going to happen. But she's like, <laughs> I, he, he, I, he going to see I love him. We'll have a baby. It's going to ch it change his heart. Ladies, we got to learn men are different from us. <laughs> they can do things that we are like, but how could you do this if you don't love somebody and want to marry them? <laughs> They're just different. And that's just the way it is. And um, the thing that I also kind of was thinking medieval, about. Huh? Kind of a medieval version of Funny Girl. Um. <laughs> funny Girl? What's that? Oh, the play, the the the, the play about uh, Fanny Bryce. Never mind. It's oh, okay. Now I have to go look that up. Thank you. I always yeah. like to look at plays and stuff like that. But uh, you know, it's just um, and also, you know, sometimes people end up single moms because they were in a relationship, a marriage even, where it didn't work out, and they're divorced, and, and but they still have the children they need to rear. There is a patron saint that you can. Um, asked to intercede for you and um she she you know made a bad decision when she was a young woman you know whatever but she she had a, a moment of repentance um found a stable home for her child she had a career for herself because she devoted herself to care for the poor and she's just a powerful patron saint for women raising children alone saint margaret of cortona well it's about that time that we need to go over and look at some of the uh listener interactions let's go yes mm -hmm. We have uh, Doug listening on WCIX in Concord, New Hampshire. The second parish, uh, the second my parish went to online giving, I jumped on the bandwagon. No more folders, no more checks, automatically done once a month. Don't have to think about it. My parish can count on my donation no matter what the situation. You go, Doug. That's great. Mm -hmm. We got an email from Helena in Deep River, Canada. 
I rediscovered Canada. Canada, oh Canada. I don't even know how how they're that oh Canada, their anthem, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, Helena. But uh, she says, I rediscovered my love for adoration after reading in Sinu Jezu. Oh, now this book. book is always with me during adoration and you can get it at EWTNRC.com. We've talked about that book yeah, many, many times on this show. And we also have a uh, uh, heard from Angela watching on Facebook Live commented, uh, "Our church in Waterloo, Illinois, started having Eucharistic adoration in the church parking lot. Priests have a giant door slash window in the rectory, and they place the monstrance in uh, for every for everyone to stay in their car and adore Jesus for one hour every Saturday evening. Mm. Wow, what a great idea!" Mm-hmm. Gina joining us on YouTube comments. Um, Greetings from Texas. Thank you, healthcare workers and all those in the medical uh, medical personnel that work in the hospitals and clinics. May God keep you and your families safe. Blessings to all. What a kind oh, shout out. Very, yeah, nice, very nice. We do need to say that. Uh, text from Billy. My husband and I have visited the Basilica in Cortona. Great story. Oh, I got to get there. Uh, Cortona, yeah. Italy. Well, coming up tomorrow, since we're talking about super moms. No discussion on super moms can be complete without talking about Mother Angelica. We're going to talk about Mother. She's a different <laughs> kind of mother, but she's a mother. <laughs> yeah. We're also going to talk about how has Jesus been the good shepherd in your life? A little reflection on the gospel readings coming up for the Sunday. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Well, let us uh, conclude today with uh, a prayer. You know, Lord, watch over us. Watch over our steps. Watch over our our eyes and our ears that we might see and hear the people who are crying out. Uh, for your presence, that we might be that presence for them each and every day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and guide you discreetly in his ways all the days of your life. The Catholic Church sees the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life, to which the other sacraments are oriented. Our Holy Mass is next on EWTN Radio. If you're currently an EWTN media missionary or just interested in becoming one, we've got some great news. EWTN Media Missionaries has a new and improved website. EWTNMissionaries.com, designed with you in mind. Our new site is loaded with great features and it's easy to navigate. There are so many different ways that you can help EWTN.